โมทัสสะภะคะวะทะวะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะภะคะวะทะวะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะภะคะวะทะวะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะพุทธังธรรมังสังฆังนามสามี
You could say that's the greatest kind of compassion in passing on the knowledge to people who can use that knowledge for themselves to free themselves from suffering. Yeah, the Buddha pointed out he couldn't do it for us. He's not able to enlighten us. But he can give us the means, the tools, the information. He set the example in his own life and he gave us the explanations of the way to practice. So he gave us as much as he could, but he couldn't actually make anyone enlightened. They have to do it for themselves. But he gave them the greatest gift, the gift of Dhamma. And that's the kindest thing that you can do for someone is give them the Dhamma. Whether it's just in a moment when they, they need some advice or encouragement or support. Or like the Buddha giving the whole pathway that leads from the starting point where a unenlightened human beings suffering all the way up to Nibbana, freedom from suffering. That's the kindest thing you can do for anyone, isn't it? Give them the, the means for them to get out of their own suffering. The, uh, the knowledge, the uh, pass on that knowledge to them. That's the greatest thing and the kindest thing that will help them. Of course, when people come to practice loving-kindness, whether it's as a meditation or a theme in their daily life, often it very quickly runs aground, strikes obstacles, because we are, as unenlightened beings, you know, we are still conditioned partly by our attachment to ourselves, our views and opinions, our sense of self, our possessions, the people we're attached to and so on. We have all kinds of attachment and clinging. And when you come to practice developing the thought of loving kindness, it will run into obstacles because, because we have attachments. That includes you know, disappointments and suffering based on our relations with other people. Other people don't always do what we want. And so we often get caught into suffering. Other people sometimes even harm us and we suffer. So if you sit down to practice loving kindness meditation or just bring it up as a, a thought, an aspiration, already there might be a voice in the back of your head that say, well, I can have kindness to this person or that person, but not this other person who's hurt me or who's caused me all this trouble. But the Buddha said, you know, look at that more deeply. Look at the what's going on in your mind. Sometimes to see your attachments, you have to challenge them a bit. So if you focus your mind on the thought of loving kindness, and the Buddha taught us to practice universal loving kindness, you know, learning to have cultivate the thought of kindness, compassion towards all beings. Well, if you start doing that and you run into an obstacle, it starts to show you where your attachment lies. And you, quite quickly there may be a person that pops up into your consciousness, you know, their memory, their perception of a person that you don't like or you've you're against in some way or you've been hurt by so you have anger when you think of them. So then you have the challenge, the task of well, what do I do about that? How, is it something I should just accept that I'm angry with this person because of what they've said or done? They've hurt me in some way or they obstructed me or caused me some trouble? Am I just going to stick with that? Or is there any other way? Can I actually break down my own barriers of anger and attachment and release myself from that kind of suffering? And this is something that we have to learn, that where we are caught into anger towards others 
or ourselves or particularly or even to situations and experiences we're suffering when we are caught into anger ill will hatred whether it's mild irritation strong anger or strong hatred we are suffering when we are falling under the influence of those mental states and we have to recognize that and sometimes the only way to recognize it is by first of all trying to cultivate kindness and you might reach <clears throat> a point where you're, you've got a brick, you're hitting a brick wall and say well I can't, I just can't forgive that person or think of that person with goodwill or sometimes it's ourself we just got built up over maybe many years a habit of being angry with oneself, ourself, because we didn't achieve what we wanted to achieve, or we made mistakes, or we've fallen into habits of feeling guilty, self-critical. It's only when you start to practice the meditation or develop metta, or loving kindness meditation, that you realize maybe how much anger you have, or where it's lying in your mind, in your consciousness. Because often it's suppressed, it's deep down, and you're not really thinking about the people or the things you don't like or get, make you angry in the world most of the time. But it's only when you start to develop thoughts of loving kindness that it comes up. So it's one of those meditations the Buddha said, practice daily for good mental health so that you can see where anger is forming or where you're still clinging, attaching to thoughts of anger, negativity. And often there's a lot of work we have to do. It's not something, if you're angry with someone and you've been angry with them for a while, in your, you know, every time you think of them, remember them, you have anger arise. It may, it may take quite a lot of effort to change that. But this is something that's very valuable, isn't it? The first thing you, you tend to do is justify it. We all, because we have a sense of self, we attach to this sense of self. If you're meditating and you're spreading thoughts of kindness, you notice you're angry with someone, well then you'll have a voice comes up in your mind saying, well I'm angry because they did this or this happened. They said this, they did that. You know, there'll be reasons that prompted you to feel anger, angry towards those people. Maybe those reasons have been reinforced over time, so it's quite automatic and you just have a, what we call a bias, akati, bias of mind where you think of that person and quite quickly, immediately, even spontaneously, anger arises, ill will, and you dismiss, dismiss them as your enemy or somebody you don't like. So, of course, goodwill, metta, immediately falls flat, doesn't happen, doesn't start, doesn't begin. Or sometimes it's for yourself. You maybe have your own accumulated self-hatred, self-anger, and as soon as you, know, you hear the instruction, direct the thought of loving kindness to yourself, you can't do it. There's a block. You feel angry and say, no, I don't deserve it, I'm no good. And you hear this so many times when people, they've been carrying around negative thoughts towards themselves. They just can't forgive and let go yet. So whether it's towards yourself or someone else, you have to, that's where you're beginning and that's where you have to work, you have to practice. I like the story of the school teacher who was trying to teach the young kids in their class how to recognize the suffering of anger because you know, it's natural when you go to school and you're not yet very wise, you'll build up preferences and prejudices. There'll be other kids in the class that you like and then be kids that you don't like. And School kids you know, sometimes are very cruel to each other, bully each other. So all teachers know this is a problem. So this teacher was quite creative, so she 
made this, uh, invented this task for the kids. She said, tonight when you go home from school, I want you to think about anyone that you're angry with or that you don't like or that you hate and just count up how many people you th you can think of that you know that you you're angry with at this time and then for each person that you you can think of and you're angry with or you even hate collect a tomato and bring it to school tomorrow in a bag so if you've got one person you're angry with, that's one tomato. If you've got ten people, that's ten tomatoes. Doesn't matter what the number is, but however many people you're angry with, you're, ha you're hateful towards, bring a tomato to represent each person. So they came to school the next day, and you know, some kids had one or two tomatoes, some had a lot. And then the teacher said, okay, the next part of this task is you've got to carry this bag around with you wherever you go for the next week. And just stick to this task. Don't give up and don't put the bag down. Don't lose it. Forget it. You've got to carry it with you. Because those tomatoes represent the anger, the hatred you have in your mind for somebody. So let's study and see what it's like. So the kids started to carry this, these bags of tomatoes around and the first day wasn't too bad but the second day, the third day, you know, the tomatoes started to go off, go rotten and then they start you know, becoming mushy and smelly and the kids all started complaining to the teacher and saying, oh, I can't carry this bag of tomatoes anymore, it's just smelling so badly and they're all weeping and they're falling apart because they're going rotten and they couldn't reach a week all the tomatoes had gone rotten and the teacher gave them permission to throw the bags away but she asked the kids well what did you learn from this and they said well we learned that tomatoes go rotten and if you carry them around with you it smells it's unpleasant and the teacher said well this is like your angry thoughts they make your mind go rotten and carrying around with them, it's like you've got this, constantly got this rotten smell, this burden that you have to carry around with you. Because anger is a form of attachment, clinging, isn't it? The technical, technical term is vipavadanha, craving for non becoming. You don't, there's something you don't want, and you, you desire things to be another way than they are because they're, they're the way they're, they're something you don't want has come to you or there's something happened that you didn't want and you fall into aversion could be something as simple as a fly landing on you in the summer here we get flies so a fly lands on you you get a little bit of aversion or something much bigger you know somebody you're full of hatred for because they've insulted you or caused you trouble at work or in the family you know, there's, there's many grades of anger and ill will that we succumb to but they all have certain characteristics in common. One is that you're suffering when you have negative thoughts to do with anger or ill will or even hatred. You're suffering, aren't you? As long as you're clinging to them, identifying with those thoughts, it's like you're carrying your tomatoes with you and you have to be with the rotten smell. That's something you can obviously in anyone in any walk of life can be aware of but when you come to meditate you become really clear that holding on to negative angry thoughts is suffering. And what's also becomes clear is that you're the one who has to put them down or let them go. No one else can do them, do that for you. What we tend to do, say at this time, holiday season, what we tend to do is get rid of our stress, our negativity or anger by indulging in pleasures. And that tends to be the human habit, isn't it? We seek pleasure and happiness, you know, material happiness. So this time of year we're all eating nice food, meeting friends, watching movies, sleeping more than we usually do because we're not working, whatever. We're seeking pleasure, sense pleasure, 
to get away from some of the stresses and some of the aversions that we have in our life. But that's not really learning, is it? That's not really understanding the suffering of anger and letting go of it. That's simply covering it over. And that's the more common human reaction, isn't it? You have a bit of pain, stress or anger and then you seek some, something to distract you from it, to relax you or take, take away the pain or the suffering of anger. Well, what we're doing here is learning to bring up mindfulness and meditate on it and understand it and see where the root cause of our suffering is and that's where we're, where we're clinging in our own mind to thoughts rooted in anger or memories that trigger anger. And this is why meditation is so valuable whether it's uh, lust or sense, desire for sense pleasures or anger, ill will, hatred all the different mental cases that the mind can get caught into the only way to really root them out and free your mind from them is by cultivating the path meditation, sila, samadhi, panya, mindfulness, wisdom you know, we have many ways of refer referring, describing this, this path but it's all aiming at to developing more awareness and understanding of this human mind, each person's human mind. One thing you learn, you know, the more you develop awareness of your own mind and start to free yourself from mental defilements such as anger or hatred, one thing you realize is that everyone else has much the same kind of mind. You know, everyone else gets angry. If I'm angry, other people also get angry. If I'm suffering when I'm angry, other people must suffer in the same way. If I feel very tense or you know, all my adrenaline comes out when I'm angry and upset or lose my temper, other people are going to suffer in the same way. It's universal. And that can be a useful insight to develop as we're dealing with our own particular attachments and anger. We realize that these things are just common experiences for all beings. Everyone is subject to greed, anger, delusion. Everyone has a mind. Everyone can get caught into delusion and then suffer because of it. That also helps you to develop more kindness and compassion towards others because you realize, well, if you've suffered, but now maybe you've freed up a little bit of your suffering as you've practiced, other people can also do the same. They can free themselves from suffering because they have a mind like I have a mind. We all have a mind and that mind is a conditioned thing. And if you train it in mindfulness, wisdom, loving kindness, the, the skillful qualities, then your mind is going to be freed up from the, the opposite, the greed, the anger, the delusion, the mental defilements. So this is why we spend so much time talking about and practicing meditation and particularly bringing attention back to this mind of ours because that's really where our problems begin and end. And if we're caught into anger then we have to see that as long as we're willing to hold on to those thoughts or dwell on those thoughts we're going to keep suffering. And even though it's a challenge to give up anger, especially if you feel it's justified because somebody hurt you or something went wrong or there's some seemingly good reason for it, we have to get to the point where we develop stronger mindfulness and clarity that can see really anger is always suffering, whatever the cause, whatever the set of conditions led to you becoming angry, it's always suffering, it's always to be abandoned. That's why the Buddha gave that simile, there's a number of famous similes such as the simile of the saw, like you know, even if you were grabbed by bandits, terrorists, bad guys and they were starting to saw your arm off, if you gave in to a mental moment of anger towards those people who were soaring your arm off, you wouldn't be practicing what the Buddha taught. 
Because the Buddha has no choice but to tell you the way it is. And the way it is, a mental state of anger, even if it's just for a few seconds, is the cause of suffering. It will be the cause for more negativity, more pain, more suffering. And of course, many moments of anger will lead to many moments of suffering. It's a law of karma, a law of nature. A mental state rooted in anger will lead to suffering. Even if you're in the middle of having your arm sawn off by bad guys. <laughs> yeah, hopefully that's never going to happen to anyone. But if it was, that moment of anger would be understandable, but it would still be a mental defilement. Which is why we have this simile. It's just to make it absolutely clear, our aim is to completely free the mind from all craving and attachment rooted in anger. Similarly for all craving, attachment rooted in lust and sensual desire. But tonight we're talking about anger more. So getting to the point where you can recognize the real problem is the anger, not the object of your anger. You're not that person or not yourself or not that disappointing situation that turned up in your life, that thing that went wrong. They're not really the problem. The problem is you clinging to your angry thoughts, identifying with them, holding on to them. That's where we've got to work. That's where we've got to strengthen our mindfulness and our metta so that it can't be pushed back by the angry conditioning that we've been allowing to kind of sit in our mind for a, a while or the, the rotten tomatoes we've been holding on for a while holding on to for a while now is the time we're having to put all the rotten tomatoes down let them go now is the time to let go of those angry thoughts that's our aim and of course deep down we get angry because we're still clinging to this body and this mind as self and until we've completely penetrated seen through that delusion well the chances of anger returning are still there but at least if we're developing right the right attitude right view towards angry thoughts we can see well okay there are times when i get caught out you know like when we're very attached to something we may not see how anger is forming when we don't get what we want in that situation or somebody we we love gets hurt or something we turn to anger very quickly but even if that's happening if you've established right views so you know when i'm angry this is the cause of suffering this is something to be abandoned that's what you're aiming for to have enough right view that you can see a mental defilement as a mental defilement when it arises. So even though it may seem justified, somebody is giving you a hard time in your life or you've got some illness that's really putting pressure on you, your, you know, your life is so annoying, you've become ill or injured and it's, or it's sad or it's painful, Getting the understanding that if you cling on, hold on to your angry thoughts, you're suffering and you're creating the causes for more suffering. This is what we've got to learn. We've got to learn how to put down the burdens of what we attach to and cling to. We have to strengthen our mind. You know, it's, this is mental strength when you can accept that you don't always get what you want in life and sometimes things do go wrong or sometimes things are painful unpleasant you don't want that but sometimes it happens it's out of your control can you be mindful enough to accept it or you can keep holding on to your angry reaction and maybe even form hatred seek revenge if you're seeking revenge you know, that, that becomes another burden another bag of tomatoes you're holding on to it makes your mind go rotten, doesn't it? So you, um, unfortunately many people live through their lives seeking revenge on somebody. It may be subtle, it may be just a few words whenever they talk about that person they don't like, they get back at them by criticizing them, stabbing them in the back, saying what they have to say. Or occasionally it you know, becomes much more, something much more solid or 
intense than that and they actually physically or in some way through some action do something against that person say something, do something but if you hold on to anger you know, this is the, the rotten tomato in your mind and it can stay with you right to the very last day of your life if you haven't learned to put it down throw it out then it will just still be there, won't it? And you'll notice at times when you're physically a bit weak, say like when you're tired, run down, stressed or ill, often that's when your anger comes out, isn't it? That's when we lose our temper, that's where we remember who we don't like, that's when all the negative thoughts come up in the mind. Those are the times we really have to strengthen our metta. So if you're experiencing some illness, that's the time to practice goodwill and compassion for yourself and then for everyone around you. Because that's the most likely time you'll get annoyed and you know, irritated and complain. Or if something's gone wrong for you in your work or your life or your relationship, that's where you have to bring up the metta. You have to keep working at it. You, you can set it as a task, a, a, a goal. Maybe at first you don't fully believe it can be done, but you know, part of the role of a Buddha and awakened teachers is to remind us that it can be done because they have let go of anger. You know, that's something that's important to remember. There are human beings, most of them are monks and nuns, but not all, in this world, living in this world today and in the past who have completely abandoned their anger through cultivating this path, mindfulness, insight into the three characteristics, seeing their angry thoughts as impermanent, as not self. There are people who have done that, completely abandon anger. So just hearing that maybe brings up some joy and makes you want to practice. Reminding yourself, you sometimes you have to do that for yourself, you remind yourself by thinking of teachers or thinking of the Buddha, or sometimes we hear it from other, t other people. But when you reflect that human beings can let go of anger, they can see anger as suffering, they can let it go, that gives you your motivation, doesn't it? It gives you your impetus to try it and strengthen your mindfulness so you can catch anger when it's arising and say, no, I'm not going to hold on to this anymore. I'm going to let it go. Whatever works. See, recognizing anger as suffering, then you want to put it down. Recognizing anger as impermanent, then you can let it go because you know it doesn't last. Recognizing it as a conditioned thing that is not actually a self. It's not a fixed part of you. It's not a person, a being. It's a mental state that comes up through delusion and can be abandoned. And therefore, it should be abandoned. And the Buddha encouraged us to do that and he gave us all kinds of tools to do it. So when you practice metta, what are you doing? Well, you're countering your tendency towards aversion, anger, ill will. Sometimes you do it before you even get angry. <laughs> you bring up the metta before you're angry. Be one step ahead of the game. Sometimes you're late to the party and you know, you're already angry and then you have to go back and start finding the metta. But better late than ever, never. Either way, it's something you have to keep coming back to because you're living in a world that is not perfect. You will never get everything you want. People will not always treat you the best. These experiences are quite normal, so you have to bring up the matter to deal with living with other people and living with yourself as well, and living in an imperfect world. Even when things go well, we have success, we can't forget our metta because otherwise we turn into you know, arrogance, conceit, look down on others. You know, we have to cultivate metta to counter that even when we're successful, even when things are going well. We cultivate metta because there may be, there's always going to be someone around who's 
less well off than us, suffering more than us. Sometimes we need the metta for ourselves when we're suffering. Sometimes we need it for others. But it's this universal quality that you keep developing. And one thing to remember is when you cultivate metta, anger disappears when you're successful. Then when you practice any form of meditation or cultivate um, insight, there will be less obstacles in your mind to seeing the truth, understanding the truth. One of the biggest obstacles is negativity, isn't it? Just negative thoughts popping into your mind, complaints, fault finding, self-criticism, criticism of others. It um, agitates the mind, stops us seeing the truth, stops us seeing uh, the impermanent nature of our body and mind, stops us seeing the uh, conditioned nature of things. Any time you can let go of anger, your mind is getting a little bit closer to awakening. It's always right to abandon anger, because anger is always a cause of suffering, it's always a mental defilement, it's always correct to abandon it. Even if they're sawing your arm off, or hopefully something a bit milder than that. When, some, when things go wrong, when they don't do what you want, when they give you trouble, keep coming back to establishing awareness and letting go of any ill will. And you're getting closer to the Buddha, closer to the Dhamma, the Sangha, your mind is brightening and you're improving the world. The world needs a lot less anger because there's so much anger around verbal, physical, between individuals, between groups of people, countries. Anything we can do to reduce that by a little bit is worthwhile. It's good for us, good for others. So maybe I'll leave you with these thoughts tonight and uh, if anyone has any questions after this we can uh, have a Q&A session.